Hi, I'm Kelly Krakow. I work with the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency. I'm going to talk to you today about groundwater and some on it. Um, so just a little overview of what we'll talk today about is uh, we'll talk about groundwater basics, drought, salmonids, effects of human water use on salmonids, and what's being done. For today's presentation, salmonids um, include coho salmon and steelhead trout. Uh, so what is groundwater? Um, just to make sure we're on the same page, I'm going to show you a little video that describes it and shows that, illustrates that. We all know the earth is full of water, but there's a lot more to water than all that blue stuff you see on the globe. The water we can see on the surface of the earth is surface water. Surface water is every lake, pond, river, stream, and ocean on earth. But in the ground below your feet, there's even more water, groundwater. Groundwater is water that's crammed in the tiny gaps between rocks, soils, and sediments under the ground. A full body of groundwater is called an aquifer. So groundwater is water that is um, between the pores of sand, soils, and rocks. Um, So um, the ability of an aquifer to hold water is dependent on many factors, not just the amount of precipitation being deposited, but also the porosity and permeability of the sediments. Um, so porosity is the proportional space between the sediment and permeability is the ability of water to travel through that sediment. And I'll show you a little demonstration here. See? We filled the speaker with about 300 milliliters of relatively unsorted gravel. Notice that there are grains of different sizes that loosely fill the container, leaving several visible open spaces. These spaces represent the porosity of the sediment. Porosity is the proportion of the volume of an earth material that is composed of void spaces. We can do a brief experiment to determine the proportion of space in the gravel occupied by porosity. We have 200 milliliters of water in this smaller beaker. We dyed the water blue with food coloring to make it easier to see. When we pour the water into the beaker, it fills up the empty pore spaces from below, and the water eventually rises to the top of the gravel. So what um, is in-stream flow? And I'll show you, um, we can get in-stream flow in multiple ways, like runoff from rain that flows over land surfaces or through interactions with groundwater. Um, <clears throat> here's an example of water flowing in the river channel in the San Lorenzo River. And you can see through here, this water, this water going through the channel that um, right here, that's, that's your in-stream flow. Okay, so whether a stream gains or loses in-stream flow from groundwater can be dependent on the location of what's called the water table. So the water table, this is a saturated zone and the water table is the top of that saturated zone. Um, and then the brown would be an unsaturated zone. So the, again, the water table is the top of that saturated zone and that's kind of what to watch here. So if you look on this side, the, um, water table is uh, higher than the stream. And so that water uh, from the groundwater can flow into the stream. That's called a gaining stream. Here, the water table is lower. So, um, and so the water can actually, uh, the stream can actually feed the groundwater, but it's called a losing stream. So the stream loses water to the ground. And that can also happen in a um, connected and disconnected way. Um, so kind of what does that look like? Here's a really quick example. This is up at Fall Creek unit of, and, and it's an extreme example, but you can see water. What does groundwater look like when it's coming out of the, out of the ground? It can look, it can look like this. It's just kind of seeping out. It can look a lot less than this as well. Um, and here's a diagram to sort of show you again, that if you have your unsaturated zone and your saturated zone and this water table at the top of your uh, saturated zone, that you know, if you think about where that water table is in re in relation to the stream, that has a lot to do with whether the stream gets water from the wa groundwater table or the um, groundwater gets um, water from the stream. 
it's a gaining or losing stream, like we just mentioned. Um, so talking about climate and drought here, a few more basics. Um, there is the water cycle that um, plays into all this. Water evaporates into the sky, condenses into clouds, and some of it returns as precipitation. Some of that water flows off um, land surfaces and into streams. Some infiltrates into the ground. Some is intercepted by plants and evaporates out, uh, evaporates back up into the uh, atmosphere again. And finally, some of that water, um, you know, will infiltrate deep into the ground um, in what can some um, into aquifers. Um, if it doesn't get picked up by roots, um, you know, uh, and makes it all the way through and can recharge our groundwater at that point. Um, so we live in what's called a Mediterranean climate, which means we have dry, warm summers and wet, cool winters. And um, this results in a dry season during the summer that can extend into the fall. And then we have a rainy season. What is... Um, so what this graph is showing you is that each of those bars, um, is a total amount of precipitation that fell throughout, um, the year going over back over a hundred, the last hundred years. And so if you'll notice, there's an average uh, precipitation line, like we'd like to talk about what's the average, average precipitation. Did we get a below average or above average? Um, and so what I'd like you to notice here is that there's not a lot of average years. There's a lot of years that go well below average. There's a lot of years that go above average. So average is sort of over time, but then year to year, there's a lot of variability um, in the amount of precipitation that we get in our area. And that also there can be cumulative years of extremely wet weather and cumulative years of extremely dry weather. And um, that all matters in terms of groundwater resources and the base flow that the streams get. So um, looking to the future to climate change and climate changing climate change models that have been done for this area, um, the average precipitation for the last, <clears throat> well, like uh, from 1985 to 2018, is expected to be about 44 inches. And the, the projected precipitation um, from 2020 to 2071 is protected projected to be potentially 29 inches. So that's potentially 15 less inches per year. So there is potential for, and the likelihood of um, reduced precipitation is definitely projected with climate change. The other, uh, and that can affect our groundwater resources um, and, and water resources. Um, but there's also that climate change uh, per Bruce Daniels is expected to change um, recharge in some other ways other than just to the total amount because uh, what gets recharged can be dependent on like air temperature, UV radiation, wind, humidity, plant types, coverage, animals, soil profiles, timing, and duration of each event. So um, the intensity as getting uh, the intensity and the frequency and the, the duration and frequency of the precipitation could also uh, drastically affect the groundwater um, resources. So um, it could be that we get, if we got, for example, if we got all of our rain in one short period, a lot of that rain, like a lot of that precipitation might end up running off the surface um, the and not as much recharge into the ground, but the converse is also uh, could have um, could reduce groundwater recharge in the fact that if we got all of our precipitation a little bit at a time over a long period, um, that then there might not be enough to infiltrate into the ground. And so the timing, um, like the frequency and duration of the uh, precipitation is expected to change with climate change. And so there's potential for even if the amount of precipitation weren't to change that just that change in timing of frequency and duration could affect um, groundwater resources. Um, can also, climate change uh, also could uh, lengthen our dry season and shorten our wet season. Okay, so moving on to salmonids. So here are little friends, the, here are friends, the coho salmon and steelhead trout. Around here, we have what we call the Central California 
evolutionarily evolutionarily significant unit of coho salmon and steelhead trout which are unfortunately not doing well um so steelhead uh so our coho our state and federally endangered um listed as a state and federally endangered and the steelhead is federally threatened species um and then an evolutionary significant unit is an individual population of that species considered to be distinct for the purpose of conservation. So there are coho north of us, but this population that's we're in, especially for coho salmon, we're in their southern range, and so um, that population of southern of the southern range is is considered um, endangered. Um, so coho steelhead and coho and steelhead used to be abundant here. You can listen to the um, this account of the fish migration. Um, that uh that John Bambachi remembers. I would estimate that they were probably there. Sorry. I saw yeah. a school of fish in 1964. I would estimate that there were probably 3,500 fish in that school. And that was one school that was staging to go upstream in the river. What? My wildest dream would be to see a return to those days and to, and to see a return, just to see people celebrate the return of those fish that the way that they did back then. I mean, it was like a carnival in Santa Cruz when the steelhead and salmon started to run. The banks would be lined with people. They would be lined with fishermen, both sides. And there would be people that just came to watch fish being caught and just see the fish coming in. I'd like to see a return to that. I saw a school of there we go. Okay, so salmonids. Um the fit the uh salmonids spend about one to two years um of the beginning years of their life, depending on the species, in fresh water, then migrate out to the ocean for about two to three years, then come back to spawn and die, or in the case of steelhead, could migrate back out to the ocean after spawning. This process of young fish hatching and growing in fresh water and then migrating to the ocean for their adult life is called anadromous. So in order to thrive, um, juveniles, the young fish, um, so that means the first year for coho and the first year or two for steelhead have particular habitat requirements at each, each life stage. Um, this means that they must have clean, loose gravels free of sediment needed for spawning and egg development. Um, so fine sediment would be throwing mud into a clean bucket of water and that murky water uh, is the fine sediment that would kind of cloud up the water. Um, which is hard on egg development. They need adequate pools and natural in-stream cover for juveniles. They need connected alcoves and off-channel habitats for juveniles to survive winter flows. They need clean, cool water, and they need unimpaired passage to and from the ocean. And they need all of these things to survive. So why focus on salmonids? Um, salmonids are an indicator species for other threatened and endangered species. Um, an indicator species can be used to understand the overall health of um, the environment for, for many species and as a proxy for the diversity of other species living in the ecosystem. So where does your water come from? Um, and this is going to be specific to um, our neck of the woods in Santa Cruz County here. Um, so in terms of uh, and and the and the um, you know around who lives around the park, but um, around our area, around the Henry Cowell um, area, um, if you live in the SLV. Uh, San Lorenzo Valley Water District Zone, you might get it from um, the San Lorenzo Valley Water District. Um, there's a Scotts Valley Water District. There are private well owners. There are small water um, companies like Mount Hermon or entities. And um, there's also the city of Santa Cruz uh, does get water downstream of um, in the San Lorenzo River. So um, all those areas uh, depend on local water and, or all those entities depend on local water and also they get them slightly differently. So like the Scotts Valley Water District has 
only groundwater sources, but and they tend to go very deep compared to how a private well owner might drill for a well uh, locally around here. The San Lorenzo Valley Water District um, gets plus or minus about half of their water from groundwater sources and another plus or minus half of their water from surface sources. Um, and they have a few different systems. Um, then uh, private wells would be drilled into groundwater. However, um, private wells tend to be drilled more shallowly, like they're drilled more shallow than a water district would. Um, and so uh, both because of the geology around here, but that those wells tend to react a little more quickly to drought and, and uh, recent precipitation rates. Um, and the city of Scott, of, sorry, city of Santa Cruz Water District, um, while it has uh, relies on surface water for its water supply, the Santa Margarita groundwater basin provides about 40 to 50% of in-stream flow uh, during low flow conditions in the San Lorenzo River. So the city of, of Santa Cruz will um, pull water from the San Lorenzo River uh, in Santa Cruz to provide water for the city and about 40 to 50% of that in-stream flow in the river when it hasn't rained in a while is coming from the groundwater basin. Um, the other place it can come from is uh, the Loch Lomond Reservoir, which uh, is released into the San Lorenzo River. So um, to orient you a little bit, the comparison of the San Lorenzo River watershed, which you can see here in this kind of yellow green, um, line versus the Santa Margarita groundwater basin, which is this purple uh, zone here. You can see how they can overlap and interact, but they have different boundaries as well. So the San Lorenzo Valley, uh, sorry, San Lorenzo River watershed in green, um, a watershed is all the land and subsurface groundwater that drains to a particular point along a river or stream. And so <clears throat> when you think about um, standing down by the boardwalk at the bot at the where the ocean and the San Lorenzo um, River meet, all the water that pours into the ocean there, any drop that could have uh, that ends up there could have could have been anywhere within this green area. Um, you can also see here that the Loch Lomond Reservoir um, is worth noting, and that that does get diverted into San Lorenzo and used as a water source as well. Um, and does uh, provide water into the river, the San Lorenzo River only, or San Lorenzo River during the um, summer month, dry months. So um, all the water in our basin and watershed comes from this area. We're one of only two counties in the state that doesn't either import or export water. So we do not use any water from the California State Water Project, if you've ever you know, spent time over the hill or in San Francisco, their water comes from a lot farther away, less locally. Um, ours comes from the Santa Cruz, you know, the Santa Cruz mountains or the Santa Cruz, you know, the Santa Cruz area um, and not the Sierras. <laughs> so the San Lorenzo Valley watershed will influence the groundwater basin and the Santa Margarita groundwater basin and vice versa. The groundwater basin can influence the um, San Lorenzo uh, river watershed. Um, and but they can influence uh, each other in different ways, depending on the geology, the topography and and, you know, current water table groundwater levels. So how does human water use affect aquatic life in the stream? So let's go back to our gaining versus losing streams. The height of the water table in relation to the stream affects whether groundwater helps to maintain stream flow during the dry season or not. California experiences a dry season from roughly May through October, but that can be extended during dry years. Um, fish in the San Lorenzo River and local creeks have evolved to adapt to the dry season. However, it is still a period of major stress for biotic life and even just minor changes to in-stream flow during this period of low in-stream flow can have major effects on their ability to survive past this stage. During the dry season, the in-stream flow gets less and less as the season persists. These are called low flows. Groundwater buffers the effects of our dry season because streams can gain water from groundwater if the water table is high enough. However, the dry season is both when human water use is uh, when humans use the most water and also when young salmon are under a lot of stress. 
lowering the groundwater table or taking water directly from the creeks and river can reduce base flows for juvenile salmon salmon is critical to each life stage um <clears throat> so reduced in-stream flow that water passing through the um the stream can lead to an increase in water temperature reduced dissolved reduced dissolved oxygen increased pollutants and reduced food sources the reduction in base flows can increase the severity or the duration of this stressful period. Maybe the dry season and low flows last longer or in-stream flow is reduced even further. So climate change is expected to exacerbate, exacerbate existing low flow conditions because the dry season may last longer or the groundwater recharge might drastically be reduced. Um, during the dry season, groundwater uh, feeds in-stream base flow for juvenile salmons and other aquatic species. So here's a video that shows how this um, stream can change and what fish might need to survive through as the dry season progresses. Um, this is a one minute video from the California Sea Grant um, to sh show how in-stream flow can decline throughout the dry season. And one of the really big challenges that these fish are facing is a summer drought. We don't have rain here all summer. Um, and, you know, the last four years we've had drought and, and these streams get really, really dry during the summer season. So even though we're seeing adults coming back and spawning, their offspring, they have to live in the creek for over a year. They have to live through that really dry season. And... Um, in these drought years, fish are not making it. It's a real impediment to their survival. And so we're working with a lot of different partners, agencies and nonprofits and private landowners to try to um, increase the amount of water that's in the stream. We're working with um, landowners to try to find a... So, oops, sorry, just to, so I just wanna highlight what um, summer dry season conditions can look like versus uh, winter high flow conditions, like and the and and how different they can look. So um, this is in Sonoma County, not our county, but it can happen similarly. Where this is October 2014, you can see that there's this little pool here. Um, this bank was a little bit uh, wet, so it seems to be you know giving off like there seems to be seems to be some seepage of groundwater into this pool um and and it's not, not like there's a lot of places to go we did actually find um evidence of fish that had been living in there um and then you fast forward two months and this is a high flow of um event in the same exact spot so this tree right here is actually this tree right here so we we're looking Pretty practically in the same spot, down down the same reach in the same location, and and the amount of water, um, you know, is just so different in these two places, in this exact same place, um, just a few months later. So that um, this is an example of how different streams can look at the end of the dry season versus during a storm event, um, like a high episodic event. The tree on the left is um, like I said, so we're looking in the same direction. Um, if you can imagine just how some how some cool fresh water seeping out of the ground can be a lifeline for a little pool like this if anyone's living in it, along with dissolved oxygen, which they need to breathe, and just you know keeping this pool from drying up and how important some of that groundwater seepage can be um, for like as these fish have to persist throughout an entire uh, year and many different seasons and yeah, so specifics on what this means for the San Lorenzo River and how it works here. Other than the San Lorenzo River itself, which is regulated by the city of Santa Cruz Water Department um, because it releases water into the summer, into the river uh, from Loch Lomond, and it releases from Loch Lomond downstream through Newell Creek and, and the uh, San Lorenzo River. But the rest of the streams in our basin, if you see water in the stream when it hasn't rained in months, that space flow is most is coming from groundwater. And so, um, Is, um, so what's being what's been going on? There are many organizations working on conserving both water quality and water quantity. 
Um, water districts have conservation efforts and um, they have laws actually that they have to abide by to protect flows for salmonids. Um, and they try to balance their um, duty to protect wildlife and provide water for humans. Um, they will promote conservation through water efficiency, through rebates, free water saving devices, conservation techniques. Um, there are a lot of other organizations as well. The Santa Cruz RCD, Coastal Watershed Council, County Programs, California Secret, and more all working on trying to, um, you know, improve things. And so, um, and then finally, the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency that I work for has uh, developed a groundwater plan that was submitted in January of 2022. And the goal is to achieve sustainability with this basin by uh, 2042, um, both for environment and environmental and human needs. Um, the plan is being is required by an act of the state of California called the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, which is also known as SIGMA. The first time in our state, it's the first time in our state history that the state is regulating groundwater use. And it differs though in past water regulation, um, you know, other ways that the state regulates water is because the state is actually asking for each groundwater basin to manage their own way of having their own way and their own plan of managing the groundwater rather than the top down approach from the state. The goal um, is to achieve sustainability by 2042. Um, the plan, the first full plan was just submitted, was submitted in January of 2022. Um, it is a form of adaptive management and adaptive management is an iterative process of creating goals and then continually monitoring results and adjusting management techniques as needed as time goes on to reach these goals. Um, the plan will be revised every five years and, um, it addresses sustainability for all beneficial users, which includes um, both humans and uh, wildlife. So in conclusion, today we talked about coho salmon and steelhead. Um, and we talked about how drought, drought naturally occurs in our area. Um, and salmonids, which include coho salmon and steelhead, have evolved with this dynamic. However, this is a period of great stress and can be a limiting factor for their survival for the survival of young fish that need to spend time in the creeks, river, and estuary to hatch and grow before they migrate out to the ocean. If juvenile fish are unable to survive this period of drought, then there are no larger fish migration, larger fish migrating to the ocean. So coho are on the verge of extinction on the central coast and steelhead are federally threatened. The lowering of groundwater levels due to pumping and water being diverted directly from the stream for human consumption can be part of the tipping point of survival for these young and vulnerable fish due to reduced in-stream flow and the stresses that come with that. Climate change is expected to exacerbate this dynamic as well. Typically, the need for water is greatest um, for both human and aquatic needs during these dry periods, which starts in the summer and can run through the fall and sometimes even um, into the winter. The lowering of in-stream flow during periods of natural stress due to human water use presents a great challenge to salmonid survival along with other aquatic species. Um, and then the reminder that there is this groundwater sustainability plan for the Santa Margarita groundwater um, basin, and it's an adaptive management plan. It's being, uh, it will be revised um, every five years and does account for both human and uh, aquatic needs. And everyone is invited to participate. Um, you can check out the www.s, uh, um, Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency. So smga.org <laughs> um, if you wanna learn more about the plan. And um, there's newsletters available. Um, we also do have a groundwater stewardship program. If anyone's interested, it um, it's to it's a little bit more of what we talked about today uh, to learn more about our own area, the basin, uh, what's being worked on, and you can contact me kelly.groundwater at gmail.com if you're interested in doing it. It needs some um, revising, but it will be up and ready if somebody's interested at the moment. Um, yeah, thank you for listening and being here and. Appreciate it.